Right, let's try again. You know when you know something needs, there's something in you that needs to come out because the prospect of about to say it just makes you feel sick to your stomach. That's where I'm at. It's weird because I've talked about like some quite exposing things on my YouTube channel in the, the last six months. But this one feels more wobbly, actually. It, um, it really does. But that's why I think it's even more important to talk about. The roller coaster of uh, post diagnosis is quite a roller coaster. Something I'm really wrestling with in myself, and that I think I've just pieced together, which is why I'm doing this video, is it's really confusing that I'm at a point in my life where I feel simultaneously better than I've felt for a long time and really good about myself, but also the worst I've ever felt about myself at the same time. And part of why I wanted to share this is because I feel this weird tension that I think it's really important that we see people experiencing things that aren't all good and positive. But I find that hard sometimes to communicate because there's almost this fear that like, if you see the hard parts and the low parts, it negates all of the good. Like somebody will go, oh wow, she seems so happy on her videos. She seems so peppy, she seems so, comfortable in herself and confident and now we're finding out that it's all a lie right and I think this is something that we all need to kind of really override in ourselves that like two things can exist at once like you can be happy and sad at the same time you can feel grateful and be dissatisfied and to be honest that's a huge reason why I sought an ADHD assessment because it never made sense to me that my self-esteem was just so messed up like why do I think I'm like this amazing genius in one moment and a piece of trash in the other moment like that was always this confusing tension but since my diagnosis it's only got worse and I was finding that really scary up until this week which is what I'm going to get on to but I also think wrestling with that is has made it hard for me to realize when like how bad things are um, especially because as somebody with ADHD we tend to feel our feelings quite deeply but they tend to change quite quickly so I don't always trust when I feel low and down about stuff because I kind of go like yeah but tomorrow's a new day or like you just need to bring yourself out of it or like it's not all been like this but I even though I'm happy about so many things right now I cry at least twice a week and feel really low at least twice a week, don't know why we're putting a number on it, but, but I'm trying to, I'm saying that to kind of illustrate that like, I've been worrying that I am depressed, but then I've been confused because I'm not always depressed. And I know that's because there are things that have fundamentally changed in me since my diagnosis that no longer match with the environment that I am in. But I feel trapped because I don't feel good enough about myself to believe it can be any different. And this is the thing, um, and the main shift that has freaked me out since this diagnosis, right? When you don't know what the issue is, but you know there's something that just doesn't seem to sit right about yourself, you overcompensate, you burn out, you get exhausted, you're constantly trying to like problem solve and make sense of it. And that's not good, that's what leads to burnout and that's what leads to like the low self-esteem and stuff. But that is like an active emotion. It's a forward emotion. Since my diagnosis, I went through what I've, I've read about is quite common, which is like a honeymoon period where you suddenly go, oh my God, this wasn't my fault. There's a reason why I am the way I am. Look at this whole new world. Look at all of these great things. And I went through that and it was amazing. But the place that I've been in the last few months is going, now I know these things about myself. I have to give up a sense of hope that it's ever going to be different. And I know that's not, com that's not accurate, right? Because of course things can change. You, The whole point and the whole value of understanding yourself better is being able to use different strategies and build a better life for yourself. But just there's a fundamental hard thing to let go of, which is feeling like a piece of hopefulness has been stripped away. And that's what has been worrying me because 
hopelessness is not an active emotion, it's a depressing emotion. So whenever I've been coming up against challenges, most of the time I feel hopeless in those challenges because I can't see a way through how I feel about myself. And with that for me, for the first time in my life, over this period of time, I have felt worthless. I hate to say it, right? I hate, I hate that because I get, as I said earlier, I feel like it negates all of the things that I love and appreciate about myself, but those two things can coexist. I can feel worthless and I can also think that I'm pretty magical, <laughs> but it's, that's just the truth. That is the truth of it. And I've been wrestling with this and trying to kind of make sense about it and had ups and downs. And I spoke to my therapist about it this week and it was an interesting one, right? Because you go, is feeling hopeless and worthless because of this big change and this big thing that's going on in my life affecting my mood? Or am I depressed? And that is putting a lens of worthlessness and hopelessness on everything. And I think it's a bit of a reciprocal thing, but the way I see it, it's more the, it's more the thought that's causing the low mood. Because after a great conversation with a therapist, after talking about what I want to talk to you about today, I know I'm longing this out, but I'm also building myself up. I felt immediate sense of relief and the low mood completely lifted. So I know that it can be, it, it, I'm not stuck in it, like it can be gone. But I Googled worthlessness, right? Feelings of worthlessness. Cause I was like, th I'm pretty emotionally literate. I can describe a whole range of various emotions to you, where I feel them in my body, what, the, what I'm thinking, what they mean. But worthlessness is a new one. And the article that I read said, Thanks for asking. Everyone gets down sometimes, but right now I'm on the up and up. Did you hear that? Google just thought I asked how it was and it said, thanks for asking, everybody gets down sometimes, but today I'm on the up and up. It's actually kind of beautiful. Where was I? <laughs> yeah, so I Googled worthlessness. And it said, worthlessness is not an emotion. It is a judgment that is attached to the feeling of shame. And I thought, oh yeah, that old thing, that old thing, shame, shame. It's shame. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about shame, but mostly about like how I'm experiencing it. The reason that I'm gonna do that is because Brené, lovely Brené, the shame master, says something really great about shame. And this is why I've chosen to do this video and to talk about it, even though I want to call up in a ball and just turn myself inside out. Shame thrives on secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put shame into a Petri dish and douse it with these things, it will grow exponentially into every corner and crevice of our lives. The antidote to shame is empathy. If we reach out and share our shame experience with someone who responds with empathy, shame dissipates. Now, arguably, I'm putting this into the abyss of the internet where, you know, people might not all respond with empathy, but I don't really care, to be honest, because I know that lots of you will, so whatever. Um, I want to take shame out of the Petri dish because I think that's the only way we get through this. And in a weird sense, <laughs> realising the extent of my shame this week and voicing it has made me feel hopeful for the first time in a few months because I'm almost back in problem solving mode, but in a good way, right? It's like, oh, I see that and I get it and I understand what it is. And I understand the pervasiveness that it's had on so many aspects of my life. Now we can do something about it. So it's been weirdly encouraging, even though it feels horrendous. So you might be familiar with shame generally as like, an idea. Um, if you've read any of Brené Brown's work, you definitely will be. I've also bought this book that I haven't started reading yet. See, I've made it into a project, obviously, <laughs> which seems really good. It's got really great reviews. So I'll loop back around once I've actually read this because it, it, it's got some slightly different definitions in terms of like how shame is perceived and like the function of it. But just to do some really light touch definitions on shame, shame is focused on the self, not the behaviour. It's not, I did a bad thing. It is, I am a bad thing. It results in us feeling flawed, unworthy of love, belonging and connection. And it's not a driver of positive change. Shame is not a positive emotion. It causes us to want to withdraw and disconnect. And Brené Brown's definition that came out of her research is this. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed 
and therefore unworthy of love, belonging and connection. And I know as I say that, on every logical, objective plane of existence, that I am worthy of love, belonging and connection. <laughs> but the shame pit runs so deep, um, you can't talk yourself out of shame that easily, right? And this is where shame and ADHD comes into play. Everybody has shame, is a universal human thing. We are social beings that are looking to each other to feel belonging and validation and understand how we can fit into being loved and belonging. I'm actually just gonna find the article that described it really well. I'll put the link to the description of this as well. It's by Christy Taylor Jones and it's on, on a Medium blog. The problem is that by the time somebody is diagnosed with the disorder of ADHD, there's a good chance they've developed another symptom, which is far more debilitating than not being able to find your keys or spacing out in the middle of a conversation. The longer it takes to get a diagnosis, the longer they've been living with it. It's the hidden tormentor of shame. Shame comes from years of feeling bad about behaviours you cannot control. Unable to manage emotions, you may lash out. Unable to focus, you may fail in school. Unable to remember what someone just said, you incur the error of parents and teachers. No wonder people with shame-based ADHD feel flawed and unworthy. They feel there is no way to repair or redeem themselves. I guess that I share that because it was when I read that that I really like recognised and felt it in myself. I don't know what it's like to do a day and not feel bad about something. And I say bad because we use so many other words than shame, right? I feel guilty. I feel bad. Like, oh, I feel bad that I didn't do that thing. I feel bad that I didn't wash up again. I feel bad that I said that. Like, we say bad. It's shame. I feel shame. I feel shame every single day. I don't know what it's like to not feel it. But with that comes the realisation that it is possible not to. And I've never realized before that there are people that don't and everybody experiences shame right we, it's it's very normal but for me adhd shame is the fact that every single time i look at something on the floor or washing up that hasn't been done yet or a text that i've not replied to i feel shame every single time i try and set myself a goal that i don't reach or say i'll go for a walk and don't go for a walk or say that i'll release a youtube video and not do it i feel shame I can't set myself goals with metrics because when I don't reach them, I feel shame. I can't have a conversation about my financial future and what I want and don't want without crying because I feel shame. And that sounds really negative. And you know, some, I was gonna say some days are better than others, but the shame is always there. It's just my emotional bandwidth to cope with the shame sometimes is better than others, right? So when I was in a shame spiral and feeling really low this week, losing my keys, full on shame storm, right? Like, why am I like this? Why have I done this again? Da, 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 da. When my life is feeling good and I'm doing things that I enjoy and I feel like I'm fulfilled and nourished, the shame doesn't spiral. It's like, it's like there, but it's like, okay, we're working on that. We'll park that. So it's not like every day is an absolute shame shit storm, but every day I feel bad about myself about something. And it's just whether I have the emotional capacity to stop myself falling into a shame pit. And since I got diagnosed, I've just been able to fall further and deeper. I feel like the shame pit has had to crack open after my diagnosis because there's like an unmasking, I guess. There's a, I'm no longer gonna put myself in situations that don't work for me anymore. I'm no longer gonna force myself to do things that don't work for me anymore. But in that you have to reconcile the part of you that doesn't wanna let go of being who you think you should be and who you've learned that you should be. And the thing that made me recognize it as shame before I'd kind of put it into those words is that I've had so many conversations with people over the last couple of months where I feel like I'm stuck in a problem that I'm trying to solve about what I do next in my life that seems really straightforward, but I'm stuck on it. And it's that sense of hopelessness, right? And I keep coming back to this thing that I think people find really hard to hear and I find hard to say, um, which is, but if I wasn't me, it wouldn't be a problem. So I'm the problem 
so I need to deal with it, right? It's fucked. It's a fucked cycle. It is this complete weight of responsibility and I've always had this issue and I think this is what will hopefully help with it. It's like, I always feel a complete weight of responsibility that like everything that I feel and think and do is my responsibility to fix or change or like just get right, I don't know. But it's this real sense that I have at the moment that's leading to this hopelessness where whenever I have a problem, I can't just see it as an objective like, okay, then we fix it this way because I have this whole visceral and I feel it as I talk about it. That's why it's like the, it's like a shade, a sh shame cloud that just radiates from within everywhere that feels like, but if I wasn't me, it wouldn't be a problem. So I am the problem. And that to me is the root of this shameless shaminess shamey shaminess if you've watched the cartoon big mouth by the way or if you haven't watched it that has a really a really good depiction of the shame wizard and how that it's oh i mean you know me i love metaphorical storytelling about stuff but they do such a good job i'd recommend watching big mouth i think it's in the second season something that really annoys me about it though is um i'm constantly told by people not to be so hard on myself and this is where it becomes kind of meta. <laughs> you kind of have shame about the shame because I feel like I am trapped in a cage of my own making. And people will say, don't be so hard on yourself. Why are you so hard on yourself? Look at all the amazing things that you do. Look at the amazing things that who you are. I have people in my life that love me, that will say to me, you do know that I love you because of these aspects of you, not in spite of, right? Amazing. I don't believe it right now and being told don't be so hard on yourself is frustrating because it's like i know i know but i didn't i'm not i don't choose to feel this i didn't come out all fresh as a baby being like i feel a deep sense of shame that i am unwanted like it's just not that's we, we are created by the environment around us but then we internalize it and so even when we're shown evidence to the contrary we don't believe it but then you end up feeling like you've trapped yourself in this shame of cage and that it is your fault and it feeds into the responsibility kind of intense cycle and i haven't talked about rejection sensitivity yet but to me this is all very intertwined rejection sensitivity is that aspect of adhd where we are um really sensitive and have a strong emotional reaction to being criticized or rejected or perceiving that we've been criticized and rejected. There's different schools of thought around rejection sensitivity and people do experience it differently and at different degrees. And there's the debate as, as there is with a lot of this stuff, which is like, is it just an inherent part of ADHD or are we sensitive because we've experienced a lot more rejection or correcting or feeling criticized in other people? The way that I personally, um, define it in myself is that as somebody with an ADHD brain I have a depth and breadth of emotional in, you know intensity that makes me more sensitive to everything and then when you combine that with feeling like rejected or feeling like something doesn't quite add up about yourself it combines into this like pit of shame right so I do think about it as rejection sensitivity but I kind of see, I see those two things as really intertwined, like the rejection sensitivity and the shame. Because if somebody said to me like, oh my God, you're so short. Like if only you were a bit taller, you'd be able to reach that cupboard. Or even if someone said to me like, God, I think you're really boring. I don't feel sensitive to those things because I don't believe those things about my, myself, right? The things that I fall into rejection sensitivity shame spiral about are the bits of myself that I've learned to reject. They're the bits that I feel don't, or have learned to feel aren't worthy right like it's being told that i'm messy or that i'm all over the place or that i talk too much or i talk too fast or i um just need to do things in order or i never get i never finish anything or i just need to be more consistent or i'm too sensitive the emotional one's massive thing for me like that's the stuff that puts me into a shame spiral and so i just i don't believe that my ADHD makes that true. I believe that the world responding to me has made that true. And I hold all of that inside in a pit of shame that with time and the right support and the right strategies, I will be able to unlock and get over. And that's what makes me feel hopeful.
but I like to keep saying this, I think you have to break down before you can rebuild. And I think that the only way, well, I know this, I was talking to my therapist about this, and I know this, people say this, the only way through shame is through shame, right? You can't go over it, you can't go around it. It's like going on a bloody bear hunt. You, <laughs> you gotta go through it. But I also realized something really significant in therapy this week, as we sat with the shame. I'm not scared to feel shame. No, I've done a lot of work on f not being scared of negative emotions and sitting in negative emotions. I'm not scared to feel shame. On a good day, I'm excited to feel shame because it means that it's progress. My problem is that I don't have time to process my feelings in a world and a life and a society that is always on going to work, working five days a week, coming home, doing this, doing that, doing all the bills, seeing all your friends. Like the, the, the structures of, the, the structures of society don't give me time to feel and process my feelings. And then I don't really know what to do with that because then I just have a whole existential thing about like, how, how do I then fit into the world? Because I can't just go off and maybe I can, right? I can't just go off and do what I want. Like it's, it, and it feel it's it's trapping, but then the good outcome of realizing that is me going, but that's good because it's not that I'm scared of this feeling. It's not that I can't cope with it. It's not that I can't do it. It's that something needs to change in like my environment or my timetable or whatever <laughs> to give myself permission to deal with this. There is a lot to work through. So right now for me that looks like sharing this, speaking to Mr. Rachel about it, which was immediate sense of relief, by the way. Honestly, the whole voice your shame thing. It's reading this book about shame. I've started doing some self-compassion exercises because the antidote to shame is self-compassion. I'm also writing a book, <laughs> casual. I've been writing a book for, uh, before my diagnosis about managing my inner critic. And this is a huge part of that. And I have a funny part of me that's like, even in the depths of the shame is like, this is good material. So, you know, you, it's all the trade off. Um, but that's just, that really just helps me process stuff as well. And making some decisions about how I'm gonna spend my time. Oh, I'm also gonna do a shame audit. Of course, make it a project. I'm, I wanna audit my life and basically go, which aspects of people, places, work, recreation, like where, does shame show up most in my life? And where can I remove the unhealthy shame? And what are the areas where I feel like they are good, almost like training grounds for me to learn to feel and move through my shame to a positive outcome? But what are the ones where it's like not helping and we just need to get rid of? And I have an idea of that, but it's all quite scary. So thanks for being here. We can do hard things. Lenny thinks so too. <sighs>